So you can see the results of the poll and sort of who's joining us on the line today. And I did want to point out that there are some folks who are joining us today who don't necessarily feel comfortable being their authentic selves at work just yet. And I think that that's an important part of why this conversation is so critical. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined by an esteemed panel today. And I'm going to provide them with the opportunity to share a little bit about who they are um, and their experiences within the, the PNC insurance industry, but also as a member of the Pride community um, and sharing a little bit about sort of their perspective and off the top insights. So Desmond, I'd like to start with you. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining. I really appreciate you taking your time here today. So my name is Desmond Marichaud. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a claims analyst at AIG Insurance. I actually started off my insurance career in sales and then I moved on to claims. Um, I found that I really enjoyed helping people and claims provided that environment for me to do so. I was actually very fortunate when I started AIG. Um, at AIG, sorry. Uh, so right away, they had invested in me through the AIG Academy, which is a early career development program. So that really helped set me up for success in my personal and my professional development. Um, I was also grateful for the opportunity um, with the investments made for me to uh, pursue my CIP and CRM designation, so Chartered Insurance Professional and um, Canadian risk management. So, so far my experience has been very positive. It's been, it's been really great. I've met a lot of great people. I work with a lot of great people as well. Um, moving over to my lived experience as part of the LGBTQ2S plus community, that has been a journey, um, a journey that will continue throughout my entire life. Um, that involves exploration, self-discovery, and discovering myself, my truth, my strength, and my courage. Fortunately, I have been blessed to have a very supportive family and friends and community around me, which I am very grateful for because I know not everybody has that. Um, so today, what I would ask everybody is to please just have a little more compassion more understanding, more kindness, and more love. And I say that because I truly do think that this world can use more of that. The question I would pose for everybody today on the line um, is how do I create a safe space for my LGBTQ2S plus colleagues in the workplace? Thank you. That's great, Desmond. Thank you for that introduction and sharing, you know, the components of, of your own journey within the insurance industry. And I think you asked a really thought provoking question is how do we live those values of love, understanding and compassion out in the workplace? And what are some of the ways that we're, we're evidencing that and really encourage folks to share their answers and thoughts in the chat. Uh, Anne, I wanted to ask you to introduce yourself. Off mute here. Hello, everybody. And uh, my name is Anne Hildreth, and I'm very delighted to be here, quite honored actually, and to share some of my story. My story in the industry is a, a common one for peers from my generation. Uh, I like the way you described it in the opening poll sort of the, the master class of over 10 years. I definitely fall into that. And uh, part, you know, in my generation, it was common to fall into a career in, in risk and insurance, not to particularly choose it, which, and it's wonderful to see it as a first choice uh, these days. I was a new immigrant to Canada and my first interview and my first job offer was as a junior underwriter with BI&I, now, uh, now known as HSB Canada. And interesting that I've come full circle and I now hold the position of Vice President with HSB Canada. 
albeit in between, I had several positions with other firms, including a 25 year wonderful career with Marsh Canada as a broker in progressively more senior positions. I always say I came out as an ally many years ago. I've always devoted time to volunteering with organizations that inspire me and interest me. I started volunteering with Owens many, many years ago, and that is the Ontario Risk and Insurance Management Society, for those of you who are unfamiliar. ORIMS is one of the largest chapters of RIMS, which is the global society focused on the advancement of the practice of risk management throughout the world on educational, professional development and professional certification and diversity, equity and inclusion. I will speak later to you know, my volunteering with ORIMS and how it resulted in my current director position as a volunteer as their very first DE&I director. But it all stems from being a strong ally, from my passion and, and really being dedicated to those goals. I'm now also on the Global RIMS DEI Council. And um, I think it all stems from being feminist, an advocate for the underdog, and an ally for really all equity seeking communities. I'm a proud mom, as my t shirt says of a gay son and supporting him, helping to make our industry and our community more inclusive is even more important to me and inc increases the volume of my already loud voice. And I think I would echo what Desmond said. I think, how do we create that safe space? How do we enable and facilitate, you know, uh, those that aren't comfortable being themselves, being their whole selves, covering up, how do we facilitate and make, make for that safe place? Thanks so much, Anne. And I can speak from firsthand experience that the power of allyship is so, so important in terms of enabling people to feel comfortable, uh, to feel um, authentic in who they are and to be able to um, you know, operate at their at their optimum as well, right? To give everything that they have to the work that they're pursuing. So I'm excited that that will be a further part of our conversation today as, as it unfolds. Allison, I wanted to provide you with the opportunity to introduce yourselves to yourself to the audience today. Thanks, Trevor. And I'd like to um echo what Desmond said. Thank you all uh, who have come to this fireside chat today, whether you're a member of the community or an ally. Um, it's great to see so many people uh, trying to be involved. My name is Alison Bullock. Um, I am an open and proud transgender woman. Some may say too proud, but we'll get to that later. Um, I am a bodily injury adjuster for the Workers' Compensation Board in uh, Alberta, uh, which means that I'm on the plaintiff's side. This is a new um, experience for me. Prior to this, I was a bodily injury adjuster with an insurance company. Um, and like Desmond, I also started my career uh, on the sales side. Um, I am new. I am three years into my career and I transitioned during my career. Um, one of the things that I will talk about later is the troubles that uh, openly transgender uh, individuals, especially women, have in just securing uh, employment. Um, and uh, the, my story is longer than two minutes that I have for this introduction, so I'll get to that later. Um, I think the question that I want to ask is for everybody, when you hear the term transgender person or you hear the term transgender woman, who or what is the immediate thing that comes to mind um, because of the representation that is current in both media and cinema? Um, it's very interesting to me to see what, um, what your first thought is, um, whether it's a celebrity, um, an act, uh, a political event that is going on, um, I would really like to know what, um, what immediately comes to mind for you. 
Um, I think that's really about all that I have. I'd like to talk more um, at some point in the future when it's my turn to speak. And again, just thank you, everybody. And thank you, Trevor, for putting this on. Thanks, Allison, <clears throat> for being here today and for also that that question, you know, what is it that we think of? What does representation currently look like? Where do we aspire it to be uh, in terms of the the images and the individuals or the, the adjectives or the ways that we would describe an individual who may uh, be a part of the trans community? Um, Jeff, wanted to provide you with an opportunity to introduce yourself to the group today. There we go. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jeff Ince, and I work at Marsh Canada uh, in Toronto as a placement specialist. Uh, I've been with that group for about six years, and I've been, been with Marsh just over seven years. I'm unique, a little unique in the business just because I've been on the claim side. I started its claims career uh, on the Royal Insurance Company 20 some odd years ago, 27 years ago, I think it was. Um, and I've been to brokers and I've been to claims management companies and, and back to brokers. And I, I was I was a co-owner of a broker for at one point and finally ended, ended up at Marsh uh, where, um, not finally, but I have been here at Marsh. I hope to end my career here at Marsh um, where I've been here eight years. Um, I, um, as I said, been in the industry 28, 27, 28 years. Um, I am a proud parent of two children, they're twin girls, they're 19 years old, and my ex-partner and I um, went through the surrogacy and um, IVF clinic uh, process to, to get those kids. Um, so as I say, they're now 19 years old, and we, my ex-partner and I at that time, we got married also before marriage was even legal in Canada, so that was 1997, um, we did that. So I pushed a few boundaries for sure along the way. I'm very proud of who I am and what I've done and where I'm hopefully going. And um, I uh, am very happy to 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 I guess sit on this panel with with a colleague, ex colleague of mine, and and we started the uh, Marsh uh, Colleagues Resource Group, the Pride Colleague Resource Group at Marsh Canada uh, six years ago. I'm going to guess seven, five years ago, um, Anne. And that was as co-founder. As co-founders, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, one of my, my most uh, proud of uh, achievements, I think, as far as LGBT uh, things go in, in the insurance industry. Um, I don't really have a question to, to put to the group. I, I, I wish that unless you want to, I can pose this as a question. Don't what, don't think that if you if you think there's a perfect time to come out to to the to your your colleagues or your yourself even or get don't bring your most authentic self to work. There's no perfect time to, to, in my mind to do that. Um, but I, I encourage people to think or to do that earlier. That, that would be my regret as well, that I did not do that early, earlier in my life. So, or in my career, I should say. So um, that that's, that's me in two minutes. Back to you, Trevor. Thanks for sharing that, Jeff. And I think, you know, you're raising a really important sort of consideration and point for folks that, you know, sometimes we we can feel it bubbling to the surface and we're wondering when would be and looking for those opportune moments. And sometimes just knowing that taking that step, if you're in a supported, safe and, and great environment, sometimes those baby steps can be the thing that actually provide you with the opportunity to feel relief, right? When you do it for the first time, you then have the opportunity to take that next step to continue the conversation, to continue, um, you know, moving forward and, and eventually hopefully being able to bring your whole self to work. And I would agree with you um, in my own journey. I think that that's been something that um, I've started to think about more and more is, you know, the, um, I guess, really leaning into my first question for the fireside chat about the power of representation right and knowing that at the space that i'm in in my own career 
um, you know, is there now power in, in being able to say like, yes, I am a proud gay male, but at the same time being able to um, leverage that as an opportunity to create pathways for others who are considering a career in this industry, right? And so I think I'm going to pose to all of you, you know, what is the power of representation? Why does it matter? Um, and why is it important right now? Often we hear, well, it's 2021. And sometimes I pause and think to myself, it is 2021 and there's been a heck of a lot of progress, but we're still having this conversation. And so wanna hear from you in terms of why that's important. Um, and perhaps I'll start with you and then I'll work my way around the gallery. I think there's two very important reasons. Um, first of all, it's the right thing to do. For a start, we want everybody, as you've already said, to bring their whole self to work, to be their best, to not be covering. Um, and it makes business sense to attract and retain the best talent. The cost of exclusion is enormous. Estimates are in billions. It comes also at a great cost in the form of compromised job satisfaction, mental health issues, um, wanting to leave a company, you're just not feeling like you're welcome or you don't belong. This industry is about people. We serve people, we are people, we're, we, we don't produce a widget, we don't produce a product per se. People are our most valuable asset, all peoples. And um, there's a fight for talent in every industry right now, but I'd say even more so in our industry. And we would just, we just need to build equity. We need everybody to feel like they belong. And it's good for, it's good for economic reasons as well. It's good for business reasons. Yeah, uh, it's one of the questions that I'll be asking a little bit later on is the business case for it. But even just from a standpoint of as people, I really appreciate your sentiments there, Anne, in terms of, you know, when you're trying to attract the best and the brightest, I think you want to make sure that that, uh, that magnet is for everybody. Right. And um, the, the broader, you know, the community that you're trying to attract and, and creating spaces for folks to feel comfortable being who they are, but also to, you know, give of their, as, as we said off the top, their very best in their organizations, um, I think is really meaningful and impactful. So thank you for that. Desmond, how about for you? Why does representation matter at this point in time? Yeah, definitely. And that's a, that's a really great question. And representation matters to me because, well, I know how it feels not to see myself. So when I see representation, I see, oh, I can belong too, right? I can be part of this conversation. I am visible. And it gives that motivation um, to keep going. So I know the importance of visibility, and that's why I'm sitting here today. I'm sitting here today because I hope that I can inspire, you know, other people to know that, you know, it's okay to to walk in your truth and and be who you are. I know I've had, um, I know I've been fortunate to have a supportive um, community and family around me, as I, as I said in my introduction. But I also know that in my earlier career. Um, when I was still trying to find out who I am, I know how anxious um, that can be, and I know the struggles that it takes. So um, representation is, is really, really key for me because it, it shows that, um, you know, you're worthy and, and you're valued. Um, I do want to just quickly say that belonging is also very important. Um, actually. Prior to the um, COVID-19 pandemic situation that we're in, uh, there were reports of um, loneliness being an epidemic. So when I look at belonging, I, I look at what's the opposite of belonging. So if we don't include people and we exclude them, we can, they can end up being lonely. They can end up feeling lonely. Um, so that's huge to me because when I look at the stats and the surveys, LGBTQ to us plus communities are overrepresented in loneliness. So by reaching out our hand as a colleague, as a friend, as a community member, as a parent, as anybody, and 
accepting somebody for who they are and just embracing them, you know, not judging them, not questioning them, just embracing them for who they are, that unique person that they are and everything that they bring, then quite frankly, you can be saving somebody's life because loneliness can lead to anxiety, depression, and, and even suicide. So that is something that I just really wanted to, to touch base on because I really do think belonging is very important because it can lead to a happier and healthier life. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Desmond, I think um, that sentiment is one that rings so true, particularly during Pride Month, you know, around belonging is actually the end game here, right, is to feel like you belong. We can create diversity. I think representation is, is the first of that. I think we can certainly have conversations about equity, but I think that inclusion and belonging piece is sometimes, you know, the, the part where you know, there needs to be an exclamation point, you know, and, and or bolding or something just so that folks recognize that that's, that's what, what really creates the power, right, is, is that, uh, that opportunity to step in and, and know I belong here. Um, and uh, as somebody who has kind of wrestled with imposter syndrome throughout my career or been in situations where I was wondering about sort of this piece of myself, I think that belonging piece is, is so important in terms of being able to take that, that courageous step, right, and to feel um, not only for yourself, but those around you feel that sense of belonging. I think it, you're right, it decreases that loneliness and feeling like you're on an island and feeling like you're a part of the whole, the whole community. Allison, how about for you? Can we have uh, your perspective on sort of inclusion and belonging and representation, why it matters? I think your question off the top really hit on, on some of that, but wanted to, to hear your thoughts as well. Um, so Trevor, when I think of the term representation, um, to me, it's, it's a responsibility. Um, there is not much in the way of representation for those of us in the LGBTQ2S plus community who are designated by their gender identity. We have lots of um, examples of uh, individuals who are in positions of strength and power who are identified by their sexuality, whether they're gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, pansexual, anything like that. But the gender identity part of the community does not have much in the way of representation. And some of that representation um, is not positive. Um, so for me, um, to me, it's a responsibility. Um, I'm dedicating my career, uh, my life, um, and uh, everything that I have about myself to provide representation for the next generation. Um, I don't have anybody to look up to. Um, I don't know anybody else in uh, the insurance community who is transgender. Um, I can't think of anybody in a position of uh, responsibility um, who is openly transgender. Um, so it's my job um, to not look for representation, but to be the representation um, and to show those who are closeted and struggling with their identity or those who are young um, and trying to determine what future they have. Um, or, um, and this is a personal thing for me, is the family members of individuals who have come out um, with gender identity issues um, to show them that they can still be successful they can still have a career, they can be financially sound, they can find love, they can be positive members of the community, they can be safe. That is something that is not just a transgender individual or a trans woman issue, it's, it's, a, it's an issue for all women, safety. Um, so it's my job. Um, and I take it very seriously. It's why I'm here today. It's why I'm a career counselor. Um, it's why I work with uh, trans help groups um, is to be 
the representation because there's just not enough of it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Allison, um, all that you do. Yeah, Allison, I think, you know, when we hear, you know, your sentiment, it makes me so privileged to have you a part of the Career Connections Ambassador Program, you know, to know that your story, your voice of inclusion is going to be a part of the conversation and, and to have that as a part of the, uh, the, the practice that we're bringing out into the world to show that the industry, uh, it does have opportunity and is doing, I think, taking some steps to try to be the community that it needs to be uh, for, for everyone. And, and I apologize. There's a very good chance I'm going to cry at least once in this. <laughs> All good, Allison. You just made me cry. You just made me cry. <laughs> Jeff. Any other thoughts or pieces that you'd like to add to the initial part of our conversation today? First of all, I did see Anne crying, and um, I know and well enough that she she does cry. This sort of thing, and I support her and I love her for that. So, um, I, just, I just want to recall one situation that happened to me this year where we're speaking about representation, and that is I um, one of my colleagues at Marsh, uh, who's on the, the LGBT uh, sort of the Pride. Uh, uh, colleague resource group at Marsh recently got a, a very good promotion and I wrote him a letter, uh, an email congratulating him on that. And he, I got a, a response back from him saying, and I was really taken away by this because he said something to the effect that Jeff, without leaders and representative representation like you ahead of us, this present, this, this promotion likely wouldn't have come or may not have come or something to that effect. And he thanked me for my, uh, what I've done over the years and this first time anybody had sent uh, me something like that. So I thought that was uh, a big thing, very worthwhile. So. Yeah, and Jeff, as you're sharing that story, I was actually on a dive-in call with you when I think that email, you first okay. received it. Yeah. And uh, that story has stayed with me. And I think that that's um, a huge part of, um, you know, the the conversation that we're having today is that it's honoring the conversations that have come before. And to Allison's point, you know, she currently does not see herself reflected within the industry, but is taking some really amazing steps to bring, you know, the I think uh, a voice of experience to the conversation. And we can see the success that each of you have, has had in your career. I wanted to comment, each of you have come from different segments of the industry. Each of you have had very pathways to get here. Each of you are very successful in your careers. I think it's important that we also echo those aspects of your identity and that that's an important part for folks to, to understand too, that you know when we combine those two things, we're a powerful voice, not only for those who are a part of our segment, but also for attracting that next generation of talent and, and giving them a place within our community. So. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the the next question that I have is again for all of you, and and I just wanted to to touch on this from the standpoint of what do we think we're getting right as a sector when it comes to inclusion and belonging? Um, what are some of the things that we've seen kind of evolve over the over the space for sure? And. I wanted to start with Allison. Uh, perhaps you can share with us just a little bit on like what you think we're getting we're getting right here. This is a this is the question I've been waiting for, Trevor. Um, I've been in insurance for I think four four years now. Um, I transitioned. I knew I was going to transition. I transitioned socially, but not uh, through my work, and that's a different story. Um, I made a conscious decision with my partner at that time. She was an insurance professional and we were plotting out life and how I could be successful in the future. I had no idea who I was going to be as a person when I transitioned. Um, I did not know what part of my personalities would change how I would feel being in public um, as my authentic self. Um, and it was decided that insurance, which is something that had been a part of my life because my partner was in it, offered me the best chance at success because it's diverse. 
there are many women like Anne who are leaders inside our industry. There are, there's representation of minorities like Desmond, people of color um, who have the opportunities. Um, they had, um, my partner at the time worked for Intact. They had a diversity committee. I've never heard of that before. So I made a, a conscious choice to choose insurance as my post-transition career because of all of the things the industry was doing right. And they're doing many things right. You know, they hire women, they promote women, they hire people of color, they promote people of color. There are members of the community um, that are, you know, successful. They listen, they, they have, you know, inclusion and diversity in company policies. Um, I think the industry is probably doing it as well as any industry out there. Um, and I think that the people who are, um, who, who are dealing with this and who are pushing the corporations forward need to be um, acknowledged for that because it is as forward thinking and as diverse and, and as inclusive an industry as I think we're going to find. We're uh, not there so, yet, though. Yeah. We're not there yet, though. We're not all the way there yet, but um, the steps and the, and the process has started, and that's what we're doing well. We're ahead of the game. We're farther along than most other um, industries, um, and I think um, we're succeeding because of it, because as Anne said earlier, we have all different walks of life that are involved. We're getting all different opinions and all different lifestyles and we're, we're understanding better how to deal with the the, the, the people um the, the clients and the customers and all of that because we have that representation inside the community inside the, the uh the industry thanks for that allison because i think you know when we look at the the statistics so 62 percent of the industry identifies as as female or as a woman, 36% um, are in the C-suite. That's a leaner in the financial services sector, but to your point, I'm not sure that we can rest on our laurels, right? We may have gotten there organically, but there there is opportunity, I think, for us to continue to grow and, and to continue to thrive. When we look at individuals of color, we're in step with the Canadian labor market, but when we look at our senior echelons or our, our managers and, and above, uh, we are not at parity. We are. We have work to do. Um, uh, certainly, in terms of where we see ourselves, in terms of the, I, I guess, wanting to be that leader in in the EDI space. Um, I think the other um, piece is just to recognize. You know, there is conversations to be had about all types of inclusion and and diversity. And you know, I, I those certainly will be pa future panels. But I'm conscious of indigenization and conscious of, you know, conversations around, um, you know, making sure that global talent sees themselves reflected in our workforce. And I think that they do, but I think that there's opportunity to tell that story more loudly and more bro broadly. But it certainly heartens me to start on that note, Allison, to know I that, gotta, that I gotta we've tell created you, a really great space. Yeah, I got to tell you, Trevor, if there's any board out there that wants some transgender um, representation on their senior executive, I am totally open to it. <laughs> Excellent. <Thank you. laughs> Fantastic. Are there any other sort of thoughts that, that panelists wanted to share? I'll just invite you to maybe raise your hand or just signal to me if you have something that you'd like to say around sort of where the industry is at or even where it has opportunity to grow in this regard. I would just echo those comments. So um, we, we have a long way to go. I mean, Jeff and I have been in the industry a long, long, long time, and we've seen so many improvements. And this is a great example of that. And the rainbow flags we're seeing all over social media, but we want to see the rubber hit the road. We don't want companies checking boxes. We want to see that, that representation leadership positions and in the executive. We need to see that. It's very important. 
I'm voting for Allison to be on our board. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I would echo uh, that, Anne, as well. And I, I, I have this, this situation, there's a situation where I've, I'm, I'm caught in with, with representation because it seems to me that if you, if you want to be represented on out there as, as say a, a leadership role within your company, you have to come out of the closet. Otherwise you can't be seen or you can't be, um, you won't be known as, as LGBT and you won't be known therefore as representing um, uh, colleagues that you, you work with as LGBT. And I think a lot of people may not want to come out of the closet or it's too early or it's too late. And so the, the people that are LGBT that don't come out, won't get promoted, won't get that, um, that, that uh, attention that they so quite likely deserve. So it's, it's very hard for, for people to, to get those initial promotions of leadership when they ha haven't come out of the closet themselves, because that, that's, it seems to me a, that the first, the first step has to be being known as LGBT to us plus. So. so it's almost a cart before the horse thing. If we create yeah. a spirit of belonging, then perhaps we'll see sort of that inclusion and representation um, increase within, within our organizations just by uh, creating the space to have those conversations and folks bringing in their authentic self. I once worked with an individual who said, you know, it wasn't until they came out that they were, it always seems like they were holding something back in their career. Well, I know, just I'll, I'll make a quick, because I know we're, you may be behind, but I thought I was out of the closet. I've talked to at work about it. I've done this and I've done that. And I, this is right up until five years ago. Um, and I, I, will, I will say that I'm in my 50s. So it, it's, a, it's a long time I thought I was out of the closet. And then when Anne and I started the, the CRG group at Pride at, at Marsh, I went another half half distance more out of the, I mean, I really thought it, I was in, in the, out of the closet. Well, I screamed out of the closet at, when I was when we were finished with that CRG uh, resource group. And so uh, there's lots of room to come out. There's, there's, there, you'll be coming out for years and years and years and will be to get more and more comfortable as you talk about what you want to talk about, so. Exactly. And I think I think that that's an important part for folks to realize on the line today who are in the ally community or are aspiring to be an ally is that each and every interaction sometimes is another opportunity to to come out. Right. And so the the way that we need to um, check ourselves or think for ourselves or think about sort of is this a safe space for me or am I in the right spot to be able to have this conversation. Um, I think I think that's one area where the industry has room to grow um, is by creating those spaces uniformly across the industry and recognizing that it's not a half in half out kind of space. It needs to be you know one where where we can do exactly as you said, Jeff, is step into the light and let that kind of shine, right? And and to give us an opportunity to really um, you know be be who we are and and to celebrate that. Um, as I, you know, kind of am, am observing the conversation, I'm hearing lots of sort of uh, really great pieces. And I wanted to sh spend some time with each of you just to zero in on sort of aspects of your own story. Um, Allison, we will spend a little bit of time together. And I wanted to hear from you um, you know, you've talked a little bit about this, but is there anything else that you'd like participants to hear and understand about the trans community and your own experience as a trans identified woman working in insurance? Oh my goodness, I don't know where to start. I know um, it's a big question. It's a, you, you know, you gave me that question a while ago and I have been fighting over what to say about it, um, right up until this um, this meeting started, and I'm I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Um, what I can say is, I can't speak for the community. Um, I can only speak for myself, um, and if possible, in the future, maybe amplify um, the voices that aren't heard. I have a lot of privilege. Um, I am a trans identifying woman, um, but I am economically sound. Um, I own my own home. Uh, I have a, a vast social network and social media presence. Um, I am one of the lucky ones. Um, coming out enhanced my life 
saved my life, um, but it enhanced my life um, and my standing. Um, I guess one of the things that I would like people to understand is no matter how hard you think it is for a transgender person to come out and to live their life, it's harder than you think it is. It's an everyday struggle. Um, every situation has the possibility for danger or embarrassment. Um, and it takes a lot of strength and a lot of resiliency. Um, and for those who aren't as fortunate as I am, um, who didn't have the ability to, to plan um, how this was going to happen, um, any and all sort of support is like, it's, it's life altering, it's life saving, um, it's life changing. Um, there's a lot of, it, it seems to me that the gender identifying part of the queer community is the one most at risk at this time. You know, um, there are eight states in the US right now who are openly trying to ban transgender athletes. Um, the United Kingdom is, um, is overrun by the gender critical movement yeah. um, with people who are uh, adamant that transgender women aren't women. And, you know, recently they banned underage transgender uh, children from being able to take puberty blockers and hormones. We are at risk. We are under siege. Um, but we ain't going anywhere. You know, it's hard for yeah. me to find, it's hard for me to find anybody this day when I talk to them and I tell them who and what I am, who doesn't say that they don't know, that they don't have somebody whose child has come out. Um, and it's like, and it's just, it, it's, it's, it's there. And it doesn't matter how hard it is. Um, we are not going anywhere and we are everywhere. Um, Allison, I love that. And one of the things that I also just was really picking up on as we were having, you know, the, the time with you mm -hmm. is I think it's so important to recognize, you know, when you state that, you know, the gender identified aspect of the pride community being those who are most at risk, we also need to remember that the pride movement started with trans women of color. Damn right. And so I think there needs to be an, a, a real step back and wondering why, wondering if, wondering how we can, I think, take those next steps as an entire nation and also as an industry uh, to create space and to, um, to write that. Is the only way that I can think about it. So thank you for your for having a courageous conversation with us. And I think, you know, I certainly understand you can't speak on behalf of the community um, that you're speaking to your own experience. But I hope that you also are coming away with a lot of pride in the job that you do of telling stories in a way that I think resonate and give us sort of an opportunity to to reflect on and to take away a really positive image of a trans identified woman uh, in the insurance industry. So thank you for that. Thanks for her. I um, wanted to sort of close, you know, our time together, Allison, just with a question about, you know, represent sort of representation once again, and also just sort of what it means to be living your authentic self. Um, what is what does that mean? What does that look like for for folks? And, and how can we describe it? It's goddamn amazing. Yeah. Excuse my language. I was going to say something a little bit stronger, but that's 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 about as. <laughs> I appreciate as, the the, yeah. <laughs> the self censoring, but thank yeah. you for that. I don't um, have a seven second delay. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot 
believe how utterly amazing I feel and well, how my life is. Um, you, when you do these things, when you're, uh, I am 49 years old. I socially transitioned at 45 and I transitioned in my employment at 48. So I've had a lot of time to think about this. And my best case scenario was nowhere close to what my life is right now. I am so blessed. It truly was a life-saving decision. I have no idea what would have happened if I did not. I managed to make it 45 years. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to make it much further. As Jeff said earlier, I wish I would have done it earlier, but I'm not sure that I was ready to do it earlier. I'm not sure society was ready for me to do it earlier. Um, this is when I did it, and I am just so happy with my life. It's being authentic. It is the greatest gift that you can give to yourself. It's also the greatest gift that you can give to others. Um, it, you know, we are leaders, even if we don't know it. I can't tell you how many cishet individuals who are in my social circle who have said that I've inspired them to live their truth. Now, their truth may have nothing to do with their sexuality or their gender. Mm -hmm. It may have something to do with their life choices, um, their career choices, um, who they want to partner with. Um, and they say that I see you live your truth and it makes me want to live my truth. Um, and I think that's something that we need to take as a responsibility and certainly something that I take as a responsibility is to, is to lead by example and show people just how great living your authentic self and living your truth truly is. My life is amazing. Um, I, I just, I can't, um, I can't say it any other way. Um, and I did not think that it would be this amazing. Um, you know, I, I was so scared. I did not transition until I knew that I was secure in my position because transgender women have trouble getting work. Now yeah. I will say, I will say that I am one for one in applying for interviewing and being offered a position as my authentic self. Thank you, Kathy Cox, who I know is here. Um, and, um, but you know what, like it's that fear that you just can't, that you just, you can't take that risk. Um, but I took the risk and um, I'm better for it. And I hope the world is better for it. I think we can all agree that it is. And Allison, thank you for um, sharing that and, and what it looks and feels like. And, you know, why the actions that we're taking as an industry and when we have conversation about careers and authenticity, you know, how those two things can equal a really amazing sort of combination. If one can be their authentic selves, no matter what that looks like, and I appreciate it, your commentary there, you know, if our backgrounds, our expertise, our gender identity, our uh, sexual orientations or our race, ethnicity are all a part of that equation. But if we bring that to our career and we find meaningful work in an industry like insurance, it's all the more reason to, you know, find uh, find purpose and find joy in, in our lives and uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. And certainly I hope highlights to those on the line today why allyship is so important and why creating these spaces is just good for business as well. Um, Jeff, that's one piece that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is from your perspective, can you tell me a little bit about the business case for EDI? And what does it look like in the insurance industry? Um, I think, again, been there, being in the industry for so long, it's it's leaps and night years ahead of where it used to be, and it's it's, it's expanding all the time. But it seems to me it's a, it's a June thing, and it's it's well, it's great that it, that it's Pride Month and it's 
uh, we all get out and we can, we can be proud and we can talk on, on panels like this and and that's all nothing wrong with that, that that's, we should continue to, to do that but it seems to end pretty much uh, you know the end of uh, june and it becomes another month you know august is another month of something and so so somehow i i, I know i know our my, the company i work for is very out in its promotion and 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 um uh Good work, kind words, and supportive actions uh, for LGBT colleagues and and all other uh, uh, um, groups that within within the company. And I'm I'm very happy for that. It makes the, I know I'm talking about the, the most senior person in the company who, who sends memos out constantly refers to ED, EDI issues, and um, it makes me proud to work for for a company that does that. So as long as senior management, they have to talk about it. They have to promote it. They have to know that the, and the middle management has to know that it's coming from the senior management and they, they have to they have to start doing it too because the middle management and companies are very that's kind of the, where things break off I, i've seen over the years but um i think uh, it's it's better and it's, it could get a lot better um it's 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 it may, if, let's put it this way if, if it's if i see it and i feel it and it's it's, it's honest coming from CEO of a great holding company, a large holding company. I am. A, I'm a happier colleague, employer. Sorry, employee. Um, and I. I want to come to work every day. I want to do a good job. I want to support what my company does. Um, and I. And I actively. Read, I talk great about my company. But if I'm not. If I don't feel that way, from from the senior senior people in the company, then I obviously I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be. I might be looking around for different jobs. I might be doing all sorts of things. So. But that's just not the case. If, if it's coming from the top and they're serious, they sound serious and they, they're doing things to, to, to promote those those goals, then it, it's it's very beneficial for the company and for colleagues as, as well. And that just goes down the chain. You know, if your family's going to be happier. Everybody's going to be happier if you're happy. So um, I, yeah. I, I think that's just it, right, is that it's this cascading impact across organizations. And one of the things that really sticks out for me is the McKinsey study that showed that diverse teams, diversity of thought, diversity of representation, and diversity of sort of composition of generations, as well as educational backgrounds, um, you know, proved that uh, teams are three times as effective and four times more revenue generating. So, you know, there was a part of me that was like, okay, if for no other reason than make it about dollars and cents because it just makes good business sense, right? And our hope is, is that it comes from that human element, Jeff. And I think that that's such a, a big part of it. Can we talk about ERGs for a second? I know that you had the pleasure of co-founding um, the, the Marsh ERG with Anne. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the work of an ERG looks like and, and sort of some of the ways that it's created meaningful opportunity for conversation Conversation. Uh, I'll, I'll start quickly, and Anne, you can jump in after if you like. I, I think the the, the the real what what I found anyway was education of 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 colleagues at at, at in this case at Mar at Marsh, and we we co-founded or co sorry co-partnered with our sister companies too, which, which is uh, uh, which is valuable too. So there's four we were part of a, a four company uh, group. Uh, so Mercer uh, also became involved in, in what we were doing and. Uh, it was really, really mostly Mercer, but um, the to me it was education. And I'll just one very quick example: it was a it was a luncheon I went to, or that we sponsored, or we brought uh, insurer um, uh, people to, and it was a ACT uh, lunch at Christmas time. It was the ACT ACT AIDS Committee of Toronto, and uh, the, the president of an insurance company sitting right beside me. I had it was very you know, it was a very nicely done first class lunch and stuff. Obviously, it's more than a year, year and a half ago, <laughs> and. Uh, she left the meeting and she said, I had no idea about that. And it was what U equals U we were talking about at, at the lunch. And she, she was, she's very, very senior and nobody, everybody would know her name if I mentioned it. Uh, and I, I, I thought very proud about that. There's, there's the, this knowledge was coming out uh, to, uh, to in this case, people in the restraint, but they, they didn't, didn't understand or didn't know what we, we were dealing with and stuff all the time. So I think knowledge and it was very good. We had a, a, a thing on allyship when Anne and I did a, we were together at the, CR, at the ERG or CRG, whatever you want to call it. And that, that was good. I mean, I, allyship, allyship is huge. And I'm sort of just, I, I, my time is probably up. Um, I had a friend who um, told me this story. He, he's my a boss, but he also my friend. He was told by his boss to fire me because I was gay. 
And he did not do that. He said to his boss, he said, I'm not going to do that. If you want to fire me first, you can, but I'm not firing uh, Jeff because I, he's gay. And um, so that was an ally. That was somebody who stuck up for, for me um, and I'll never forget it. So does it. Yeah, and I think, you know, the the power of of allyship and certainly ERGs, I think, give an opportunity for those groups to um, cement that allyship, right? To to under to understand, you know, the a little bit more about the community. So it's that education piece, it's that open conversation piece, and then being able to take the next steps in terms of, I think, providing, um, you know, that that safe space and being that true ally throughout. That's amazing, Jeff. Thanks so much for sharing. Desmond, I wanted to turn things over to you a little bit and and have a conversation about the next generation of talent and some of the things about your own career. What do you think is most effective um, when it comes to attracting the next gen of insurance talent, and particularly those who are from intersecting identities or a part of the pride community? Yeah, definitely. For me, I think that um, what's most important, and I believe it's been echoed here today, is support. Uh, support the next generation of talent that are coming in that can look at being more inclusive in our policies and being more welcoming in our environment and making sure that everybody feels valued and supported and guided. Um, you know, often I, I hear the phrase, um, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and that to me is having compassion and being mindful. So those are the things that I think we really need to focus on because energy is a huge thing for me. When I look at energy, that's your physical, your mental, your spiritual, and your emotional. So if we are asking the next generation of talent to come and work with us, they need to know that we are going to support them and we need to show them that we're going to uh, support them. And to Jeff's point, that's not just in June, that's 365 days a year. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 365 days a year. So we need to show that support um, and let them know that that they belong um, because mental well-being is, is something that's uh, that's really important. And, and sorry, uh, there's a second part to your question. I, I might have missed it. Uh, no, you've hit on all of it in terms of, you know, bringing that next generation in and creating an opportunity for folks who are part of the pride community or intersecting identities to feel like that they belong. And I think, you know, one of the things that you surfaced is just the comfort and the compassion piece, right? And the the conversation and, and creating the spaces within our organizations through active allyship. I think through representation we've heard today and recognizing that it doesn't just, just stop at the glossy brochure or at the, you know, the banner that we might have at our recruiting events. It needs to be embedded into the DNA of our organization so that it's your authentic lived experience um, as a part of the industry. And we see more folks feeling comfortable and confident in, in being their authentic selves. Um, Desmond, I also wanted to ask you about, um, you know, what's been instrumental in terms of helping you develop your own career um, and bringing your, your authentic self to work? Um, what does that look like? Have you had mentors? Have you had voices of experience? Have you benefited from um, different, you know, programs at AIG? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, like, like outside of, of AIG and just in, in general, um, I've had too many voices I found uh, coming from all different directions, um, you know, telling me where to go. And when I stopped and I accepted myself um, and I started to, to live as, as myself, um, as, a, as a gay black man, to, to put it uh, straight out there, um, that is when I found that I was able to, to really... Um, to really grow and to, and to really flourish. So it was that, that self-acceptance that, that really got me to, to continue to go. Um, so what I like to live by now is that I don't confine myself to the opinions of others. Um, they're just opinions. 
So by accepting myself first and understanding myself, and as I mentioned, um, having that alignment in my energy, it's what really keeps me going. And to AIG's uh, strength, um, they have some wonderful groups that I've been a part of um, through their employee resource groups. We have our LGBTQ to us plus, uh, which we call out north. Um, the multicultural group has done a really great job as well. So we cultivate those spaces to make it easier for people like myself to, to speak and, um, and to really give back. So having those courageous conversations um, really help. Yeah, uh, Desmond, you know, I think as you were talking about sort of the courageous conversations and um, the, you know, power of, of folks kind of being within um, organizations uh, talking about and creating those spaces, I think is so important. But what I really loved about your answer was listening to yourself, right? Understanding where you want to go, that you're in the driver's seat, that you own every aspect of your identity, including your career path. And you know how you choose to navigate that. You can take all of the inputs, and certainly, you know, you need folks to facilitate and help you in terms of creating opportunity. But it's up to you to seize it, right? And and I think um, having that true knowledge of yourself and being comfortable in your own skin and and being who you are is uh, is a key ingredient to to that success. So thank you for sharing that. And I wanted to uh, bring sort of a, a, us full circle. We've talked a lot about allyship. We've talked a lot about sort of the, the way that equity, diversity, and inclusion is a part of, you know, um, just good business. But you've made it a part or a tenant of your own pr professional practice. What fuels that passion? And what have you benefited from personally and professionally from that? Work. Good question. And today is a great example of that. It's inspiring. It's rewarding. It's fulfilling. I think if you change one person's life, like Jeff, you know, spoke of that example where you know you felt that he had been an ally, he had been a role model. If I can even just create a safe space for one person, that certainly just you know personally uh just was amazing i am just um yeah it continues to get me emotional quite honestly you know i do think of my son and i remember when he came out as gay as a teenager i remember thinking well thank goodness he's headed towards a career in the creative space that he's going into you know, web design in a creative area where he's more apt to be himself. This is 10 years ago. I remember thinking, boy, if he was coming into the insurance world, I don't know if he would be comfortable being himself. Today, I think I would be comfortable, right? I think today, you know, we changed a lot in 10 years. 10 years ago, I don't think I knew anybody who was openly you know, out in the, in, in, um, in the 2S LGBTQ+, I don't think I knew. So this is what really, you know, inspires me, all of you. I mean, personally and professionally, professionally, I've benefited from all the wonderful people I've met, from the networking, from, from um, just being able to, to be involved with a broader range of my community. Um, the Pride CRG that Jeff and I started at Marsh um, just exposes you to, to the executive for a start, allows you to influence. Um, I cannot think. It's, it's just an absolute win-win for me. I've met you, Trevor, through Dive In. That's been just wonderful. Um, you know, I'm meeting all of you today. To me, it's just so fulfilling and just a part of being a human being. So we need the world to be equitable. We need to find a place for all of us to feel safe and treated fairly. And whether it is our indigenous communities, whether it's Islam, we used to think and feel as Canadians that we rose above this. No, this awful homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, there's awful things going on in, in different parts of our community. And, uh, 
We just need to change this for our children for the future. And allyship, it seems to me, and that passion is certainly coming through and is, is the vehicle that you've chosen and certainly exemplify in, in making that a reality. I think it helps um, to points that Desmond was raising around loneliness to know that you're not standing alone, right? That you have an army of support um, and a community of, of those who love, accept, and, and create spaces for you to soar. I think the other thing that um, really comes out for me, you know, in, in professional communities is certainly the Diversity and Inclusion Festival that happens in so September, so diversity, yeah. or dive in rather. And I think the other um, piece that that really resonates is just that there's a, if we broaden perspective, again, it comes back to talent. We're able to spot it. We're able to know um, individuals who can continue to, to meet our talent needs. The industry is in a leadership and management gap and has underrepresentation within our pride community, within our people of color, within you know a variety of equity seeking groups. And there's opportunity there. They're represented in our early echelons. I think you know we can certainly see that rise up if if the talent and opportunity to excel in career is there. So thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to close, and Anne, I will start with you, um, about if you had a piece of advice, you know, thinking back to your early career self or uh, an aspect of allyship that you just wanted to put out there today, what would that be? Be authentic, be brave, speak up, um, be curious, learn and grow. I think, you know, if you look at the continuum of allyship, it starts with awareness, it starts with education, but the other end of that, and I think I commented in the chat bar as well to Winnie, is being the educator, being the voice, being strong and being brave. And uh, if we can all do our part to be our authentic self, don't hold back, don't cover up, you know, find that role model, find, find your Allison or your Desmond or your Jeff, right? Find find an ally, find a friend, and uh, let them be an inspiration to you. And, and you know, from ally to ally, like, to help each other, Jen. Okay. Be authentic. Absolutely. And Desmond, for yourself, what, what one piece of advice would you have for folks on the line today if they're thinking about their insurance career, if they're thinking about how to live authentically, anything that you would offer? Yeah. Um, to echo Anne's point, I would say that you have a community of support right here on this call. Um, anybody who ever just, you know, wants to talk or chat, um, you know, I'm free to, to speak and I'm more than happy to do that. And I understand that there is a lot of different challenges out there when it comes to living your authentic self. And I, I empathize with that. Um, but I do feel like it's just uh, finding your voice, uh, finding your voice within and letting that voice out. Um, you know, my mom always said to us that even if your voice shakes when you speak, you're still speaking. So finding that voice, finding that strength and, and find that courage. Thanks, Desmond, and to Anne and you, uh, to you both, I think one of the things that really stood out to me is using that voice and recognizing that sometimes it can be exhausting, right, to be the educator, yeah. to feel like that you're speaking on behalf of your community, that you're the person. I've, I've seen a couple of comments in the chat that some are the only one within their workplace who identify as a part of the community, but knowing that you can rely on allies, knowing that you can rely on voices of experience, that you have others who you can reach out to and that you feel like you belong. Um, as a part of the entire insurance space, I think broadens that perspective and broadens that voice and the strength of that voice so that even if it does shake Desmond, it's a voice that's amplified and, and uh, really shared throughout our community. Allison, I wanted to uh, give you the last word. Jeff has some drilling at his place. I'm going to invite him to share his perspective in, in the chat. But Allison, what, what about for you? What is one piece of advice that you'd have for folks on the line today who are contemplating their insurance career or who are thinking about the power of allyship or even being their authentic selves? What would that be? Um, to steal from a very um, 
popular advertising campaign. Just do it. Um, living your authentic self is difficult. It is challenging. It is hard. It requires all of your strength. But I promise you, when you find yourself and you find the love that you have for yourself when you admit not only to the world, but to yourself, who you really are. It makes all of the struggle. It makes all of the pain. It makes all of the loss. It makes it all worth it. And for the allies out there, hire us, celebrate us, give us a voice. Do not speak over us stand behind us, let us speak for ourselves, protect us, um, promote us, um, and, um, and just remind us that we are valued members of your organization, of the industry, um, and, um, and we're just valued people. Thank you. Thank you for that. And certainly, you know, as we as we talk about um, the work and we talk about, you know, the celebration that is this month, knowing that it's not done, that it continues, that this is a 365 day lived experience for for those who are part of the community. And so allyship has the opportunity to be there 365 days a year. I think as well, um, you know, for young insurance professionals who are on the line, who are looking at the at the community is thinking about, you know, their own steps to being an ally, or if you are a part of the community, uh, the LGBTQS pride community, knowing that you are um, seen, that you've heard, that you're heard, and that you're accepted, and that you have a place in this industry, I think is so great and so wonderful to be able to take away from today. Um, and knowing that uh, there are lots of folks who are going to continue the conversation and continue to create a more equitable and inclusive reality for all. I want to thank you all for joining me in this courageous conversation today. I want to thank the folks on the line. Uh, I'm a, I apologize that we are um, over time and won't have a chance for a lot of questions, but if there's anything that was a burning question, you can certainly share that in the chat and we'll do our best to respond to you. I'm going to invite you as well to reach out to me, to my colleagues, um, you know, on the panel today to continue the dialogue and conversation. If you're looking for advice on allyship, setting up an employee resource group or being a part of, uh, you know, conversations going forward. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And certainly if you're somebody who's looking to be their authentic selves at work, I'm certainly happy to um, engage in that conversation as well. Uh, a huge thank you to our audience for being here today. You've all been wonderful in terms of, I've seen lots of side conversations happening in the chat, lots of great questions to our panelists and that they've been able to respond to with each of you. I feel like we've created a really great community today and you know, over Zoom and particularly after 15 months of pandemic, it feels pretty darn great. So thank you so much for joining in the celebration of Pride Month and Pride and PNC, but also continuing as we move forward. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.